middle schoolers, you can head on out. Well, welcome to church. You know, if it's your first time here, we're so glad you're joining us. We say at Eastlake that you can belong here before you believe. Hey, how amazing was our Easter weekend last weekend? Put your hand up if you were here. You know, so grateful for all of the people that served and made it happen. I just wanted to highlight our welcome dinner that's happening next Sunday night, 6 p.m. here at church. You know, if you are new or you still feel new, then I encourage you to ask. RSVP at the Connect Desk. Well, before we get into the message this morning, I think we need to have a serious chat. I just want to take a moment to talk about the Mo. Now, I almost convinced Josh to get rid of it, and then Sunday rolls around, and you're all just too encouraging. He even got a message last night saying, do you still have the Mo? I'm loving it. So I feel like I need some support. Say no to the Mo. Is anyone with me? Wow, I feel really supported. Well, I'm glad we could have that chat. Anyway. Today, we're kicking off a new collection of talks titled Asking Better Questions. And the big idea in this collection of talks is often the overlooked relationship between good questions and good decisions. Good questions set us up for good decisions. And I'm convinced that if you will ask, answer honestly, and act on the three questions that we're going to explore over the next three weeks, then you'll make better decisions and live with fewer regrets. And we all know that we aren't the only people impacted by our decisions. And the question that I'm going to answer today, uh, that I'm going to look at today, is the conscience question. The conscience question. But first, I'm going to open in prayer. God, we thank you for your spirit that is here among us, Lord. I just pray that we have open ears to hear, open hearts to receive what you want to speak to us, Lord. It's not my words, but your words, Lord. And I just uh, pray you calm my nerves, Lord, and you speak through me, and we just get to glorify your name this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Everyone said amen. Well, I want to begin by asking a question, which I'm sure you've all pondered most of your adult life. Why do people who've had too much to drink make bad decisions? Why do people who've had too much to drink make bad decisions? Now, no nudging the people next to you, but you know you know what I'm talking about. Perhaps you have some stories, maybe uh, they're funny, maybe they're a little bit hazy, or maybe they're a bit tragic. So what's the correlation between alcohol consumption and poor decision making? As far as I know, there's no correlation between alcohol consumption and good decision making, right? I've never heard a story that concluded with, it was a good thing I was drunk, otherwise I may have made a bad decision, right? It doesn't happen that way. So bad, back to my really bad question, why do people who've had too much to drink make bad decisions? I did some science this week, check this out, psychologically speaking, and thanks to Google, there are two reasons. Alcohol increases rorefrain, I don't know how to pronounce that, I tried to do it all week, in the brain, whatever it is, which acts as a stimulant. Stimulants increase impulsiveness and decrease inhibition. So basically, there's less sensitivity to a potential consequences of a decision. Perhaps worse, alcohol temporarily impairs the activity of the prefrontal cortex. And this is the part of your brain that enables you to connect the dots, think rationally, and make good decisions. It's the part of your brain that doesn't develop uh, properly to you around 20 or 21. The bottom line is, alcohol frees a person to act without thinking clearly or feeling appropriately. It makes you brave when you should be cautious. It makes you loud when you should be quiet. Ron White, a comedian, said it perfectly when he described being arrested for public drunkenness. He said, I had the right to remain silent, but I did not have the ability to. People who've had too much to drink are inclined to make bad decisions because they're temporarily desensitized to social, cultural, and relationship cues. They ignore the obvious because it isn't obvious to them. So drunk people really can't help themselves. When someone's drunk, they don't consciously ignore common sense. It's not there to begin with. It's suppressed 
or switched off. That's why the next day, you know, they'll follow up with a message. I did what? Are you sure that was me? Oh, there's a video. So what does this have to do with you? Well, if you're drunk, it should be obvious. But of course, it isn't obvious because I covered that. But if you're sober, which I'm hoping that's most of you this morning, I'll tell you what this has to do with you and what it has to do with all of us. While intoxicated people can't pay attention to internal and external cues, sober people, which is you and I, we often choose to ignore external or internal cues. Intoxicated people have basically silenced their conscience but sober people we often choose to ignore our conscience it's that internal tension competing for our attention if we consider an option if chosen may lead to regret intoxicated people can't help themselves but often sober people we don't help ourselves and you know the truth is the results are just as devastating. So we should pause and ask ourselves every time we're making any decision, is there a tension that deserves my attention? If you're going to write down anything this morning, write this question down. Is there a tension that deserves my attention? While I'm making a decision and considering options, does one create attention? Sometimes, more times than I think we'd like to admit, an option we're considering creates tension inside of us. You know, something about it doesn't exactly feel right. It gives us a cause and pauses us to hesitate. And initially, we have no idea why. And I've heard this referred to as a red flag moment. But you all know what I'm talking about, right? It's that internal sense that something about it doesn't feel right. And when that happens, you owe it to yourself to pay attention to the tension. Don't ignore it. Don't brush it by. Don't rush by it. It's not, don't talk yourself out of it. You know, pay attention to it and even let it bother you. The problem, of course, you know, this isn't easy to do and it isn't easy for all the same reasons that we've talked about. You know, our schedules compress things. Sometimes we're in a hurry. Sometimes other people are in a hurry. Sometimes the salesperson in our head is in a hurry. If something about him bothers you, if something about her bothers you, let it bother you. If that job offer, invitation, fine print bothers you, let it it bother you. Face it and embrace it. Don't ignore it. You know, I like this quote, face that tension until it either goes away or you decide to go a different way. Pay attention to the tension. If you don't, we'll get to that in a minute. So let's get into the Word of God this morning. The scripture and story I want to look at is from 1 Samuel 24. So let's see what we can learn from the Bible. That's why we're at church, right? 1 Samuel 24, verse 4. It says, Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. You know, I love the life of King David, Israel's second king. And if you don't know anything about this story, that's okay. I'm going to give you a brief rundown so you can have some context to the scripture. David steps onto the pages of history as a shepherd boy. And during that season of his life, a prophet showed up at his house and announced to his family that God had chosen David to be the next king of Israel. The problem was Israel already had a king and his name was King Saul. But Saul wasn't doing 
doing a very good job at being king. So God decided to replace him, but not quite yet. And as time goes on, young David has this legendary encounter with the Philistine giant, Goliath. You know, you may have heard the story in kids' church, David and Goliath. So David immediately becomes a household name throughout the kingdom of Israel and throughout the territory controlled by the Philistines as well. And so it didn't take long before the popularity exceeded that of old King Saul. So Saul becomes jealous and tries to kill David. David flees and becomes a fugitive. But by now, you know, he's a legend and a hero. And this story illustrates the importance of paying attention to a seemingly irrational, and in his case, an inconvenient tension. So by the time he left Saul's service, David had a reputation as a warrior and a leader. So dozens and hundreds of men had flocked to David's side. And before long, he had a small army of his own. And it was an army made up of men like David who were fugitives from the law. And eventually, Saul gets some good intel on David's whereabouts and leads 3,000 soldiers into the desert of En Gedi to remove his threat from the throne once and for all. Sounds like a movie, right? Are you still with me? And if you're familiar with the story, like this is where it takes an interesting twist. David and a handful of his merry men are hiding in the very same cave that Saul chose. Like what are the odds of that? From David's perspective, this was the best case scenario. According to theologians, when David got word that Saul and his oversized gang were headed his way, he told his men to scatter and hide until Saul and company passed through. Once they were gone, David and his men were going to escape in the opposite direction. Remember, they think Saul is going to kill David. And all of that was working to plan, according, according to plan, until Saul gets nature's call, he dismounts his mule and makes his way to the same cave that David chose as his temporary hideout. And when he sees Saul headed in his direction, David and his men move further back into the cave. So imagine this from David's perspective for a moment. He's inside the cave, looking out toward the mouth of the cave, and Saul appears as a silhouette. You know, Saul's just come in from the bright Middle Eastern uh, sun. He can't see a thing. He walks just far enough to ensure his privacy, takes off his robe, squats down, does his thing with his uh, back to David and his men. You know, clearly this was an omen or a sign from God. God had delivered David's enemy into his hand. What else could it mean? He had already been anointed as king. Everybody knew that he was next. The only thing standing in his way was the current king. And there he is, unguarded, vulnerable, and unsuspecting. If David wasn't thinking this way, we know his men were because David's biographer tells us so. David's men whispered to him, In verse 4, he said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. You know, David, this is what you predicted. The decision's made. Let's kill Saul and go home. Come on, David, kill the king. Just do it before he kills you. You know, besides, what other option was there? Otherwise, they'd remain outlaws for the rest of their lives, and this needed to end, and it was the perfect God-ordained time to end it. Like, can you imagine the emotion and the adrenaline in the cave that afternoon? Like, imagine the pressure that David felt to act. But David felt something else. There was a tension and David felt a hesitation. Something about it wasn't exactly right, but he wasn't sure what it was. The hesitation didn't make any sense, so he decided to act. He drew his dagger, crept up behind Saul with every intention of killing him. If David is successful, the world as he and his men knew it would change immediately. But as he gets closer, the tension increases. In spite of the fact that there seemed to be no alternative, David paid attention to the tension he was feeling. He let what was bothering him bother him. David was conscious stricken, not because he had damaged Saul's uh, clothes, but because of what that symbolized. He deliberately exercises power 
over Saul while Saul was still king. And it was symbolic because it was taking away some of Saul's royalty. David still saw himself as Saul's servant. And somewhere between leaving his hiding place and Saul's unprotected back, you know, it dawns on David, seconds away from a decision I think everybody would have understood, wait a minute, um, this isn't murder, this isn't war, this is murder. And besides, David thought, who put Saul on the throne of Israel to begin with? He said, who made Saul king? God did. Who am I to replace what God put in place? This is the part of the story where we all have something in common with David. He didn't know what the outcome of killing Saul would be. He thought he did, but there was no guarantee that things were going to work out the way David envisioned them working out, right? He thought he knew. His men thought they knew. Kill the king. Become the king. The problem would be solved, right? What's up with all the hesitation? But there was no guarantee that that would be the outcome. Please don't miss this. You know, one of the reasons we ignore the tension when we're making a decision or the reason we push through and then ignore the advice of other people or even the uh, voice of our conscience is we believe we can predict the future. We're convinced we can predict outcomes. We think we know, but we don't know. You don't always can. Um, predict outcomes accurately, do you? Does anybody? Turn to the person next to you and tell them what they're thinking right now. That could be interesting. Did anyone get it right? No, because we can't predict the future. The author tells us that David was conscious stricken. This is how we know David was paying attention to the tension. Somehow, some way, he paid attention to his conscience and does something very few people have self-control to do. David changed course midstream. Instead of murdering Saul, David cut off a corner of Saul's discarded robe and made his way back to the cave with his men. Have you ever changed course midway through? Maybe uh, sending a text message with the tension not to hit send. You know, David's men are in shock when they see David. They were so close to going home only to watch this perfect opportunity slip through their hands. And, and their expressions on their faces said it all. David had some explaining to do. So he whispered in verse 6, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. To which his men whispered, Well, then let one of us do it. Verse 7, he says, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. It brings us back to the question, is there a tension that deserves my attention? You know, as adults, we get really good at ignoring the tension. However, kids is a whole different story, right? And maybe this time we can learn from them. You know, I have a four-year-old, Taya, and does anyone notice that kids dob themselves in without even realizing? You know, I have many stories about Taya, but... One particular time she came up to me and she was looking a little bit coyish and she said, Mummy, I didn't draw pencil on the wall. <laughs> to which nobody replies, oh, no worries. I don't know why you're bringing that up. No, you go like running around the house looking for where Taya definitely did draw pencil on the wall. You know, there's something about children and their conscience that over time as adults, we get really good at ignoring. So for children for a moment. Let's be like children for a moment and ask, is there a tension that deserves my attention? You know, what if maturity wasn't learning to ignore the tensions, but actually acknowledging them and living with them? You know, every time you're considering an option, stop and ask yourself, is there a tension that deserves my attention. If so, pay attention to the tension like David did. You'll be glad you did. 
What does this all have to do with you? Here's what I know. The decision you're wrestling with now falls somewhere in between telling your math teacher you didn't study for a test and killing a king, right? But the principle is the same. If there's something in you, something you can't put your finger on, or perhaps something somebody else has put their finger on that bothers you about an option you're considering, stop. Pay attention, give it some time, let it bother you until you know why it bothers you. You know, we can learn from David and how he let his conscience bother him. I love this in Proverbs 27 as I close. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Another translation says, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precaution. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Pay attention to the tension. You know, maybe your conscience brought you here this 